Welcome everybody to our brown bag lunch for today. So thank you so much for everybody for coming and joining us on this middle of Tuesday. Um, today we have a, a few great guests who have put together a really amazing project that they're going to be sharing with us, um, which is called the Digital Recreation of the Lennox Library Picture Gallery. Um, so they're going to inform us about this project and some of the thinking behind it. And this is a, uh, really uh, one of the reasons I was really interested is as we think about um, material culture and thinking about material objects, how, how we move those into the digital space. And also, as far as exhibition design, how we preserve and maintain and archive um, exhibitions, which have such an ephemeral nature, as we all know. And a lot of work goes into an exhibition that lasts for, say, three months at Bard. Graduate Center and other uh, institutions, how we can preserve those, and just thinking about the kind of uh, ramifications of the short term versus the long term with exhibition design. And so well, I'm very happy to welcome <coughs> David Schwittick and Sally Webster. Sally is a author of many articles, including uh, one recently published about this project, which you can find in the 19th Century Art Worldwide publication. Uh, she's also published in the New York Art and Culture Cap Cultural Capital of the Gilded Age. And she was for many years a professor of art history at Lehman College and at the Graduate Center uh, at CUNY. And David is an artist, designer, and filmmaker working in New York City. And his current academic interests include uh, UI and UX design, uh, digital media and technology, documentary film, and fiber-based media. And he is an assistant professor of graphic design and digital media at Lehman College. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Really excited to hear more about your project. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I just want to say one thing. The article that he referred to in 19th Century Art Worldwide is this project. Oh, okay. Because, because 19th Century Art Worldwide published it, so which is a very important frame for the construction of the project itself. Um, what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a kind of overview of what the Linux Library was and why it's important to preserve its pictorial history, so to speak. Um, so let me start with my own uh, journey into this project, which really began at the New York Public Library, made, because I was doing research on another book, and I was looking at some other work that was connected to some ideas I had to work with at the New York Historical Society. And I came, I was in what they call the Lennox Archives, in the Archives and Manuscript Division at the New York Public. And I came across, sorry, I'm, I'm going out of, okay. I came across nine photographs, and this is an example of one of them. And these date from about 1882, which is really very early in terms of documenting uh, exhibitions with the photograph at that point in our history. Um, I nearly fell on the floor because I had never seen a document so late, so early in our in our museum history that was such a rich pictorial, contained such a rich pictorial narrative. This was supplemented by some other work that I was doing when I found um, the catalog of the collection, the published catalog that was published every year, that I and I was able to connect every painting with a a citation within the catalog. So I suddenly was able to really, in my imagination, recreate this library. Um, James Lennox was the uh, man who was a donor, and this is his collection that he transferred from his private house to a uh, standalone library that's now on the site of Frick Art Collection. Um, Lennox is best known today, if he's known at all, as, a, as the premier book collector in the United States during the 19th century. And this was the art that he, 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 that he bought, that as I said, I think a lot of it was in his house originally, which is down on Broadway and 15th Street. Um, and my interest, so I, I have a huge archive in my head of James Lennox, uh, which I kind of focused down to focus just on the collection, the art collection, because I know nothing about the history of book collecting in the United States. I am an art historian by training and specialized in the 19th century, so this was really right up my alley. Um, I approached this organization, 19th Century Art Worldwide, because I, 
I've written for them in the past, and they have for about five, ten years had a digital humanities initiative. So I applied, I, I applied under that umbrella, and they were delighted and thrilled because this felt this really um, fulfilled their mandate in terms of their efforts within digital humanities. Um, I then spent a year looking for David, um, and I talked to a lot of different people, and it was very reassuring and fulfilling to find someone in my old home grounds at Lehman College. In fact, more than that, David is in my old office, so <laughs> this, was, this was destiny. Um, it was terrific talking to him and, you know, from, right from the beginning, because he knew exactly what I wanted to do. I have very little, I, would you say I have zero? I don't have a zero. <laughs> Give it good. That's I mean, a, I know what foundation. I, yes, good. I, I mean, I, I have zero ability in the digital world at the end of that sentence. Um, so uh, we, start, we started working. And what happened, and it really, it really grew like Topsy. And David's going to walk you through it in terms of his part in this. Um, I, I, and I was saying to Jesse, this was a very expensive Project. And I just want to put that into the mix because my experience is that everybody, everybody in the world knows about the humanities. They're doing. I'm thinking, no, no one's doing it. No one. I mean, there are some projects, uh, and I would love your input in terms of projects that you've come across that you admire um, and that are usable. And the usable is, and, and we were talking earlier, what, what, what utility? I mean, that is the first question with digital humanities. What is its utility? Um, and my editors were extremely difficult, <laughs> and in a good sense, with me because they said, okay, you and David are creating this fantastically beautiful site. What's its utility? What's its educational value? So I had to spend a lot of time justifying it, and, I can't, and, and I'm totally grateful to them for pushing me in that direction because what it came down to, because what you'll see is when David goes through this, it's a very simple site, uh, visually. There's not a lot of bells and whistles, but it's extraordinarily, has extraordinary depth and extraordinary richness. Um, and that richness can yield a lot of information that I spent, you know, a summer just going through all these paintings and figuring out a kind of simple term that I'm now using a great deal, which is, what was James Lennox's curatorial strategy? In other words, why did he hang the pictures where he did? And, you know, my first impulse, well, whatever fit. You know, he, that looked good with that one, that looked good with and the editor saying, no, 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 no. It doesn't, you know, if, it, if that's true, then you have to prove it. But there's usually a lot more going on in terms of choices of where things hang. And as it turns out, they were absolutely right. So, um, I'm, what I want to do now is turn this over to David, and then we'll, we'll end up with us walking through um, the site in terms of that curatorial strategy. Hello. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so Sally, I think Sally is being hard on herself. I do think you have a foundation of, of, she can use Google Docs. I mean, that's big, honestly. <laughs> Even, you know, I have trouble with people not doing that. We're just Googling something. It's hard for people. So anyway, she can do all that. And the other thing she can do is use um, a glue stick. Yeah. Uh, nice. So this was, you know, this was her original, this is like a maquette, right, of the gallery. And actually, I mean, it seems so, I think you think it's really primitive or just kind right. of, and, or, or, you know, sophomore, but it's actually the beginning stages, right, of, uh, of a real 3D view of this gallery. And, and it, it also sort of exemplifies exactly what she wanted. And when I saw it, I don't think I needed to see it, but it definitely, like, it, it definitely sparked something, and um, that's where I kind of had this idea for some kind of 3D model that can be navigated. Uh, the basic, you know, that was where, like the basic idea came from. So anyway, she had also given us, um, by us I mean myself and my, the worst person I was work, working with who was 3D modeling this, she gave us like things like this, right? These are like the original architectural drawings, um, which are helpful because they show you like the proposed wall color, like the wallpapering color, which we had no idea what it is. It's not in the black and white photos, as you can see here. Uh, what there is, though, um, is the pattern on the wallpaper behind. So we had something like that to work with. We could tell what the wallpaper pattern was 
Uh, and from here, we knew the colors. We had like clues. And then, of course, she, you know, she did other research about things like this. Like, what was the wall? You know, for me, I'm thinking, well, we have bigger fish to fry. We have to model a room. We have to model every painting in the room. We have to put where they are in the actual model. Then that's not even the interactive portion. Like, where, you know, we have to go, it's all in stages. But uh, it, this was sort of where I started. I'm thinking about the wall color, the wallpaper, and it kind of just like, wet my interest in it a little bit. So I came up with this. Um, so this is sort of like a, just a Photoshop composition where I'm looking at wall, wall color and wallpaper pattern. I recreated the pattern in Illustrator, you know, going all so these this details. this detail is from that architectural drawing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's pulled that out. I colorized it, and, you know, com composited it in the wallpaper. And it just, you know, for me, this is how I get started with the kind of work. I do something that is sort of sparks my passion in it. And I'm not thinking about details so much. It's more like art than it is design at this point. Uh, other things, uh, you know, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of not an art historian, because I am not one of those things. Uh, I'm, I'm a designer, right? So I think about, like, <coughs> user experience. What's it going to be like to, I mean, what, what was it like to walk into this gallery oh. over a century ago? And how best to take what that was like and incorporate it into something which is, you know, it's an Aristotle's version of that just by virtue of its design. It's a digital project. You know, you can't really fully grasp what it was like, but you can come close, you can come as close as possible. So I'm thinking, well, how would you do that? And what would the experience be like? And <clears throat> what other things do you want people to be able to do? Like, can they touch something and like, you know, it pops up and you can see information about each piece? Certainly that would be great. Can you compare different images? Uh, can you see a series of images or a set, a subset of images and compare all those? These are all things I'm thinking about that I would want to do if I was walking into this place, this virtual place. So. Uh, that with that, I started doing some research about projects that were like this, or you know, something overlapping at least in some way. And uh, Sally actually brought this to one of me. Brought this to me. It's called What Jane Saw. Um, and what it does, is it's it invites users to sort of virtually enter two art exhibits witnessed by Jane Austen, the the writer. Um, the first was a Sir Joshua Reynolds retrospective in 1813 at the British Institution. Um, and which was originally called the Shakespeare Gallery, the same place, different name, different owners, et cetera. And the Shakespeare Gallery was sort of like Jane Austen had visited that earlier in 1796. So here's like a good example of same place, different exhibits, different owners, but the same person's writing about this place. And, uh, but the website itself, uh, it sounds like such a good idea, but the website itself is really just stills that you know, you go from you press a, 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 a what I think is probably back then was called like a hotspot or like a an image map. This is like you know '90s, late early 2000s web technology. But you'd press these buttons, and then they would bring you to another still of the gallery. And you could press an image, and it would bring you to things. But it wasn't it wasn't quite like what I wanted. I wanted something three dimensional and and something that could move and something you could interact with a little bit more richly than. Than this, but it was a great model because it's almost the content is almost exactly the same. It maps really well in terms of content, right? Not necessarily user experience. Uh, the other, another piece I looked at was Clouds Over Cuba. This is actually like a beautiful site, um, and it's a film, Clouds Over Cuba. This is like the site that is compendium to the film, and actually, what it allows you to do is. View content from the film and other extraneous content, things that would be on like, you know, DVD extras in, in the 90s. But you can see them all here, right? And you can like navigate a timeline and you can do it non-linearly, which is key. It's like a non-linear version of the film, um, which nowadays is like nothing. I mean, Bandersnatch on Netflix was non-linear, right? Like, have you guys seen this? This sort of choose your own adventure. I'm sure hopefully everyone's seen it, but it's amazing in some ways. And it's non-linear, of course. Uh, and it brings you to different areas of the same content in an interesting way, and you can kind of curate your own content. So that was really interesting about it. Um, it's for a film, it's a totally different content area, but the navigation I found was really interesting, and just the whole, as I said, the whole site is designed beautifully. Uh, the last piece that uh, we looked at, this is later, I mean last in terms of like when I found it, but this is actually probably earlier than either of the other two. I mean, I know it is. Um, this is like early 2000s. This um, is called the Lost Museum. It's a recreation of P.T. Barnum's American Museum. Uh, it kind of like, and the beauty of this project was that it was sort of his museum was a lens into mid-19th century New York City 
and post-war, you know, post-Civil War America. Uh, and it had like all kinds of, kinds of like ephemera in it, things that he had collected over his, his time. Um, and it offers visitors a visualization and spatial interpretation of this institution, um, which sounds amazing. Again, like you read it, you're like, wow, this is gonna be awesome. But then by today's standards with like the video game technology, just on your own phone, just like Fortnite on my iPhone, is so much more, I don't play Fortnite, I'm just saying. I've tested it, I've seen it before, <laughs> and I'm actually waiting on a game right now, no. Uh, but it, it, it's like, the technology has expanded so dramatically from this point, where this is again more like, almost, there is some 3D movement, uh, but it's very limited, it's slow, uh, and it's not facile. Like when you're, you know, part of the process of learning and experiencing, is feeling comfortable using it, and that there's a learning curve here, and I, there's like a, there's a, I don't know, there's something stopping me from using it and, and seeing the things that I want. Like I, there's something in uh, in the way. I feel it's the only best I can describe it. So it needed some work, but again, this is like almost 20 years old. This project, it's it's a lifetime in, in the internet. So it's hard, it's unfair, I think, to to be so critical. But anyway, these three projects gave me some food for thought about how to improve on it on them, what, what I like about them, what I don't want to do, et cetera. So this is sort of like the three precedents that we have. Then with that, I sort of got, well, actually in parallel, I got to work on the user interface design um, and user experience. I'm kind of thinking of these things together. You know, how's it going to look? Um, where are the sort of, where are the tools going to be situated to make them natural to use? But also, what's going to happen when you're using them? What kind of things can you do with them? Is it going to be fun? Is it going to be exciting? You know, these are all the things I'm thinking about. So this is like just basic wireframe designs. I'm just designing this um, in Photoshop, essentially, um, in Illustrator, trying to think about how I want this thing to look. And I created like a loosely interactive wireframe on a web-based uh, wireframe using this. Um, I want to like name drop the technology so you guys you know know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's called. Um, well, I use Adobe XD, which is like a piece of software that allows you to do this. Um, and, and it's pretty awesome, uh, but there are, uh, there's a lot of these sort of wireframing tools now. Um, and, and they're really good for sharing this, con this content because you can create them, um, you can make them loosely interactive so you can go from page to page and you can share them with your client or you share, share them with your team and people can comment on what's working, what isn't making sense. Uh, it's, it's, it's like an essential tool for something like this. Here's a deeper dive into the um, into the wireframe. If, if a user, for example, were to click on, um, I was thinking about, and we had actually talked about this with the editors, how can you like group the paintings in interesting ways? Like paintings by the same artist, for example, because Lennox would collect, he had like a few artists that he would just collect anything he could find by them. He was just like, he loved them. Uh, he also had a lot, of, we'll talk about this later, he had like a ton of like picture portraits of George Washington by various artists. That's like another grouping of, uh, you know. So, so what, what can you do with those? And, and I wanted to just be able to gain them all up and look at them and compare them. And um, of course, each one of these thumbnails would be clickable and bring you to like the main page, which an example of which is down below. This is like the main view of a single painting uh, with the text components, the, the, you know, the provenance and the different details about each painting. Metadata is another way of looking at it in the digital realm. Um, but this is like life and death for an art historian. I mean, this is, this is everything. It's all here. You know, as David is talking about all the details that he went into, and I look at these these essays that are written for each painting, yeah. that's what I'm doing while he's working with the wireframe. Yeah. And I, I had one, two, I had four assistants helping me write these. I thought I could just knock them out in a couple of months. No, it's a lot of work. Because a lot of the artists are not well known, and uh, the the cool thing though, it's just data. So it's just you know, I mean, I beg you. you can you know at any point you know say new information comes to light and you you know you want to update it. It's super simple to just it's like updating anything right, right. online. It's very simple and it just draws from the database once it's updated. So there's this separation of form and content, which is really important here. That of course didn't exist in the time of the Lennox Gallery. There was no like the form is the content. The, all these paintings, they're, they're married together. But in the digital age, one of the beautiful things is that they're all separate. They're all separate pieces that really only come together in this particular project in this interface. 
Um, and just, I just, again, I just want to sort of name drop the technology and kind of bring you guys quickly through the, the, what went into it. Uh, but the 3D model of the gallery, which is the first thing we really worked on, this was the actual physical space, the wallpaper textures, the wainscoting underneath it, the frames, uh, the, the rug, as you can see, the roof, you know, all the things that go into the visual details. That was all done in Maxon Cinema 4D, which is a 3D modeling program. It's used for all kinds of stuff, uh, not just modeling and gaming, but product design, uh, animation, of course, uh, all kinds of different uses. Um, what, what they would head in, in, in a little bit older generation would have called CAD or computer-aided design is now done in something like this. Um, and it was done by Carlo Diego. He was a person, a member of the team. He's like a wizard with 3D modeling, and he now teaches at a PMCC. So uh, we lost him in the art department. He's now like a assistant professor. So he's pretty badass. But anyway, so on the left, the lower left, you can see sort of like an in progress view. Oh, uh, yeah. And on the right, you can see a more fleshed out view. And you can see actually the, the light source we thought about really carefully because we looked at like architectural drawings. We looked at like building pictures of the building and we noticed that there was a giant skylight over the gallery, which makes sense. I mean, how else? There are no windows. So how else would you light the artwork? There, there was no electricity at that time. So um, we were thinking about well, what, what does that mean? You know, Carlo and I are thinking, well, what does that mean for us? You know, like what does that mean in, in the 3D realm? We have to recreate this light source. So we kind of thought about that. And um, down the bottom right is sort of, it's still, in, it's still in progress, but it kind of gives you a more fleshed out idea of what the actual textures look like, what the lighting source look like. Um, <clears throat> it turns out none of that was really possible because of the vicissitudes of the World Wide Web and what's, cap you know, different types of browser compatibility issues, uh, just re the resource intensive qualities of all this content. It looks really pretty, right? But it's very hard just to stream down to someone's computer and, and operate reliably, right? I mean, this is, has to be a usable tool. So if things aren't loading properly, which would have happened, or, or taken a long time to load, that's a problem from a user inter interface and experience perspective. So we had to sort of scale back considerably the textures uh, and the lighting and all that stuff, as you'll see. Uh, and then lastly, uh, once the 3D model was created, the pictures were all in place, the, the frames and the, you know, where the pictures would go, that is. Um, we even like crafted a door for the room, all this stuff. Once that was in place, it had to be brought into uh, this interactive web app called Play Canvas. And there are a few of these around, but Play Canvas is open source. It has a lot of benefits to it. Uh, it's a WebGL-based 3D rendering engine, and it's used a lot for software design studios to make sort of like messenger games, like you know, online multiplayer games, uh, low intensity. Really, I mean, this isn't like you know, this this would not this would not compare to something like an Xbox or or a PlayStation uh, or even like a PC gaming system. There, it just doesn't have the performance because it's all happening in a web browser, right? Uh, but it's pretty good for a lot of different things. It's perfect for this. Um, uh, for example, online product configurators. I don't know if you guys have ever used these things, but like if you want to buy Nikes and you want to like customize them in a 3D space, this would be perfect for that, right? It's that, it's that kind of level. Um, architectural vision, visualizations, it's really also very well geared towards. Um, and the cool thing is, from a web design perspective, it's all... HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. If you if you have any sort of fluency in the web, you'll know that, that those are like the standards. Those are there's everything else is sort of takes a backseat to those three sort of technologies. So it was all standards compliant and open source, and it just made the most sense. Um, lightweight. It doesn't matter what device you're playing it on, like it had or you know loading it into. It didn't matter. So it was perfect. Uh, also, the other thing is these the instances of the Play Canvas models that are all interactive and everything, they're all run on on the server that it's that this website was embedded in. We were looking at other pro products that you have to pay a subscription fee for, and they really can, they maintain the content for you off-site on, on their server. That seemed like a big problem for me as a web designer. So uh, this, this had all the, this had all the bells and whistles that we wanted. It, it's also like from a workflow perspective, you can, export directly from Cinema 4D and Unity, which are 3D engines, right into this program and 
It's great. I mean, I don't know how to use it. We had a developer do this, but who lived in who lived in Montenegro <laughs> still <laughs> lives there presumably. But he um, he was like a monster. I mean, he just knew this back and front. He does this all the time. So it was like, and he's also a civil engineer, right. which was like, okay, well, this is a win win. You know, it worked, it worked out really great. So um, anyway, that's the that sort of like brings you up to speed with the design and development of the project. Um, now, do you uh, we want to walk us? Yeah. Through it, so before I start, let me. This is this is a, a screenshot from the web when the, yeah. from the website. You can get to this very easily. Just 19th century art worldwide, and it'll bring you right up to their homepage. And then you have to, to click a little bit to get to this, yeah. which is the Scully essay in 3D model. Um, <clears throat> so as I said in my introductory <laughs> words. Um, the challenge for an artist, for an academic art historian, which I am, is how do I use this as a teaching tool, or is it just, you know, just a pretty thing to look at and to play with? Can you click on uh, Mr. Click on George Washington there by Gilbert this, Stewart? This yeah. Book. So gorgeous. Okay, so embedded in every painting, as <coughs> as David's already explained, is this text and a lot of really um, excellent factual information about the painting's provenance, where, where James Lennox bought it, uh, circumstances under which he bought it. Uh, the other things that the um, editors wanted me to be very disciplined about is relating this back to Lennox. In other words, this was not a, a trip through art history. This was almost a biographical event uh, in terms of how these text panels were created, uh, which does bring us back to the middle 19th century, which is where I live anyway, so that was easy. Um, but it took an enormous amount of archival information to place it within uh, Lennox's lifetime, or I'm sorry, within his within his um, within his his world, his the way he lived his life. He was a recluse in terms of not having any <coughs> circle of friends. Some of the questions that people have asked me is, well, who was his who was his dealer? I said there were no dealers in the United States at that point, believe it or not. Um, that uh, Lennox, like a number of other uh, wealthy Americans, traveled to Europe and shopped themselves. Uh, uh, at the same time, Lennox is also buying from auction, which gives a certain kind of authenticity to his purchases. Um, and they also would deal. They would also go to to dealers that were in in Europe and buy from them. Uh, Lennox also bought from artists directly, as well as did, did a number of other Americans. Um, so let's go back because. That's the kind of factual art historical information that you can get from each individual painting. Um, what is, becomes really fascinating from my point of view um, is if we look at that central grouping, um, the central figure is Gilbert Stewart's uh, standing portrait of George Washington. Along the top are four portraits starting at the left of Washington. Uh, most of them are by a member of the Peel family. Um, at different points in his life. So it was almost like, oh my gosh. I mean, this is, this is what I learned once I started looking at these things as a group. And then it's capped on the right-hand side by Samuel F.P. Morris's uh, early portrait of Marquis de Lafayette, who was a very close friend of Washington's and um, returned to the United States in the mid-1820s to kind of celebrate the 50th anniversary of the um, founding of the country. So... This, so let's go back. Yep. All right, now the other thing that I just loved about this grouping is the other portraits, for the most part, surrounding George Washington were members of the Lennox family, including James Lennox himself. He's, James Lennox is right there. Uh, let's, see, let's see what the guy looks like. He's a real, he's a real cutie at this point. Um, <laughs> Easy, Sally. I know. <laughs> some, some We're spending a lot of time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's really sad, I mean, so little is known about James Lennox, it's, it's pitiful. And most of, the reproduct, most of the images that you see reproduced are of engravings when he was a very old man and he looked like a Scrooge figure. So I was very glad to, and actually a number of these portraits that I'm showing you of the Lennox family are still at the New York Public Library. Because what happened in 1895, and excuse my dipping into history here, um, the Lennox Library, the Astor Library, and the Tilden Trust, that was Samuel Tilden's estate, formed, they merged, and they formed what is now called the New York Public Library. 
So the, Len the reason I have all this beautiful archival material is because the whole thing went wholesale to NYPL, where it's been kept ever since, very carefully. Um, so he, so the Lennox Library still lives in part in the New York Public Library, um, and it's on the second, the third floor in the Solomon Gallery. Uh, there are a number of these portraits of the family. There were 147 paintings at the, in 1882 when this is when I think these photographs were taken, and there are now 17. Uh, at the library. So there's a lot of deaccessioning over that over the past 100 and some odd years. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm not trying to give you a lecture here. I'm just trying to kind of drop in to these various portraits, either individually or collectively, to develop narratives. In other words, I don't have a narrative thread here. I'm just going, you know, almost like a walkthrough with you, uh, which is fine. But I think as a teaching tool, it can become very powerful as a class and the instructor work together to create their own narrative. Um, let's go back. Let's go um, over to that wall. <laughs> Which is my, so that's, that's looking east. So this would be south, north. Um, Actually, I can just kind of do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess we should have led with that. So why don't I just quickly? So anyway, like you, I just want to briefly yes, go over the navigation. No, so we're we're kind of like pressing buttons, but honestly, the the rich experience comes when you can sort of, you know, you wander know, around as if it was a game or you know. Right. Okay, so you also so you want to see this seeing one. when David's doing this is there's some grayed out paintings. These are ones that we could mm -hmm. not find an image of at all. Uh, but yeah. what I've done with some of them, I've included <coughs> as much biographical and information about the painting as we can. Uh, and in some cases, they were sold at an uh, auction where there was a description. And when I have a description, we, we included that as well. Um, so we, we used everything we could find. Now, just pull back on this, because this, this was like, you know, I knew about, I could figure out George Washington, but I'm looking at this. Okay, so let me ask you, what's the subject here? What subject is, is are these Nature. representing? Hmm? American landscape. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's two paintings in the center on the on the bottom row. Does anybody know who they are? This should be any art historians know this. Yeah. One? You guys should know that one. It's Turner. No, it's yeah. Turner. 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 So what he's done is he's mixed American and British landscape. <coughs> I don't know of another instance before Lennox is doing this where an American collector or American organization, there weren't very few, there was only the Corcoran had just opened, and the Wandsworth Athenaeum had um, Mr. Wandsworth's collection, where they were intentionally putting American landscape and British landscape together. So that's a whole topic for a classroom. You know, what's happening in American landscape painting in the 1880s that Lennox may be celebrating? What are these, you know, and then getting into what kinds of, what kinds of landscape are represented? And they're a little bit idiosyncratic because he has a couple of views of Tivoli in, uh, outside of Rome, uh, which are kind of like souvenir landscape paintings. So there's, it's, there's almost a kind of infinite number of questions that you could pose for yourself. And, I, and what I have not done is I haven't taught the class, um, in other words, of using this as an instructor might as the projects that could emerge from, uh, from such a reconstruction. So let's just do it quickly, just to go on the other page, and then we're, we're going to... Yeah. Um, okay, so it's so much fun. It is so much fun. <laughs> okay, wait, let's go to Mr. Milton. Okay, um, they sent that big, large central group portrait is a, um, a work by a Hungarian artist named Munkash. Michael, Michaeli Mikash, and it's of Blind Milton dictating Paradise Lost to his daughters. It's still at the it's still at the library. It's very popular with all the tourists that are now uh, entering the your public library to look at the beautiful architecture. Um, you know, it's like Milton. What is it? It's, and it's prominent. Well, this opens up a huge part of. Um, this wall is so is so complex. I mean, there's no there's no one thread, um, but Milton was an extraordinarily famous poet. Uh, poet. He was also very prominent in the the Protestant Reformation in England and a great proponent. 
And Lennox is also a very devout Presbyterian. So the religion is extremely <coughs> important in his life. And this, in other words, I haven't had the time yet to think about, okay, I know this about Lennox and Presbyterianism. How does that relate to the painting? I, I took some flyers on it in terms of the essay I wrote for the website. Um, but I, I just scratched the surface in, in what these particular paintings, including Christopher Columbus and Alexander Hamilton, um, you know, how this all gets in this mix. And, and I, you know, I got so caught up in this, I almost forgot to mention that on the far left and far right on this wall are two gorgeous female portraits by John Singleton Copley. So it's, it, we could go on. Um, just show them that last, the, in, the entry door wall. Blood, sweat, and tears. Oh, can you zoom into the pictures? Um, yeah, yeah. And where we, when we found the paintings, we also included its present, its present location. Um, and sometimes we got the information from auction houses, but they're very cherry about doing that. Okay, so I'm just going to go really quickly. On the left-hand side, I believe is a kind of continuation of um, manifestation of. Uh, Lennox's religiosity, and it's very much based on the relationship between mothers and children. So, and and, and uh, uh, New Testament paintings of, of New Testament subjects. And then jumping across, may I ask a question? Oh, yeah. please do. The images not found. You know which images they are based <clears throat> on the black and white pictures, but you yes. just can't find like high res. What did we do about well, it? Well, kind of, it's a little bit of a mix of it is both. A, okay, good, this is a good one. Yeah, so, so, yeah, this is actually a question I have for Sally, because I'm not an art historian, and I'm wondering, what is what was it about this wall that led to so many missing, okay. like, what happened to them, and why one wall over any other, and, and her answer was, well, maybe when they were packing it all up, I don't know, they were, you know, they were less excited about these little tiny no, ones. No, no, I, yeah, I, don't, I mean, it's could be... No, the re, no, two things, it's real simple. The ones that are gray... We, the reproduction on the wall of the original photograph just could not yeah. be blown up to be legible at all. But you also see in the top left-hand corner a bowl, the head of a bowl. Mm -hmm. That is taken out of the photograph itself. Yeah, so I like where went we could, through each image and yeah. I tried to excise each one and where they were good enough, where they made like a sort of arbitrary cut, where they were fine, I left it in there. Yeah, yeah so just a question. With, yeah. the, with the ones, unlike the bowl, yeah. Where you say image not found? Right. Like Are this. you saying you know what that image? You know what was there? Kind of. It's just. I mean, sort of. Some of them are so obscured in the black and white. No, my point is, you, you know what painting is there? Yeah, right there. Yeah. Oh yes, because okay. I have. Great. All right. So that's. I that's had a catalog of his collection. So yeah. for all the image not found, you do have the tombstone information. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted. To yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that it's. <laughs> you can see how this took a very long time. Yeah. Um, but this, some of the images were like pock. They had like little pox in them because of like the age of the photo. Some of them were just terribly underexposed or overexposed, and they lack detail. But this is great because this allows the viewer yeah. at home to look for it. Right? Oh, you bet. Yeah. yeah, and that's what we were hoping. Um, so far, you know, it's funny. And this is an <coughs> aside, and I'm, we're going to okay. Quick aside. I well, my <laughs> expectation was that everybody would be going and opening these things up, and I'd be getting a lot. People just look, I mean, a lot of people said, oh, it looks so beautiful, and I loved it. But they, none of them said, oh, by the way, I know where this painting is. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll happen. Right. Not yet. And again, it's just data. Right, sorry, but it okay. is. And, and then the picture. last, yeah, the last thing, in, yeah. and then we want to get your questions. Yeah. Dave and I are very committed to having this as a template for other lost exhibitions. Maybe some ones that are really famous, you know, I don't want to know about Lennox is now famous, but um, certainly not ahead of time. And I, you know, any of you who've taken some modern art history courses know what I'm talking about. You know, um, this it could be a very good, powerful tool for recreating, you know, see the Armory Show or Whistler's first exhibition or Stieglitz exhibitions, uh, where we have a very rich archival, of, of, of archival images. Uh, it's almost like crying to do that to get this stuff up on the wall. And, you know, it's interesting because it's very tempting to just create the walkthrough. But then what makes this a digital humanities project is going underneath the way we've been, way we've been doing the lecture, looking at the richness of what these relationships mean. And then, you know, and, and the research could, could really go on and on infinitely. And, you know, you're not cracking a book. 
um, which is, I love books, don't misunderstand me. But I say that deliberately because I think a lot of people that go about doing these humani digital humanities projects are not looking at it as a, as a reference tool, as an educational tool, with the same power that we can get from a book. Okay, we're yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions, comments, or anything? Can you show us the navigation features of the arrangements? Yes, the that was, yeah, I didn't, I, yeah, I'm glad you asked. So for example, the first thing is just basic angles. So I can see how someone would get easily lost in here. So I just had these very basic buttons to just look at like different walls, right? The wall being like the thing that, you know, he, he seemed to have organized around like what wall it was on. So the other thing really simply is the, the, the artist's name is just a toggle. Oh, I see. You know, uh -huh. so you can it like just puts it on there. Yeah, because because they can be distracting, etc. So I just okay. and then some helpful um, help dialogue and info dialogue, which just kind of tells you um, system requirements, <laughs> etc. Right. So just basic housekeeping stuff. The arrangements is a little bit f uh, more robust. It's where you know you can search by a few different criteria, but um, I'll just give you an example. Like um, I think um, Co Copley, for example, I'll just sort, in essence, by Copley. Copley, yeah, sorry. And you can see, like, this is what, a, a, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm like, what, what, why, why are they bookends to this whole collection? And I'm not even an art historian. Right, I don't right. even, this is not even in my worldview. And I'm thinking, well, that's kind of weird. There must be something there. And, you know, so you can sort by artist, which kind of illuminates what he was thinking, because he certainly had an angle there. Go to and how does it, when, when there's... Uh, <laughs> When there's results on more than one yes. wall, how does that? Okay, very good question. We asked the same thing. That was a problem. So I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to think of like an example of that, but I'll just find. Look, look. There's a lot of lands here, okay. right? So lands here gives you, which again is not this. And when I'm talking with the developer about this, like, what do we do when there are different walls? And he's like, well, we could do like a bird's eye view. I'm thinking that's not very helpful, but uh, then you could. There's different views. Like, there's this is the in gallery view that we're looking at here, which is. Not very helpful, but then a detail grid will bring up the three yeah, yeah, paintings. And then you can go to you know individual ones if you want to. But this is cool for just comparing. Here's like an example, by the way, of just going to the last question or one of a previous question. This is one from the archival photo, and it just made it, I feel like I'm guessing, because it's like <laughs> it's like not really that great at all, but it's such an important piece of the whole puzzle, and we just decided to leave it in. So this is about as bad as they get. Yeah. Right? But we have the title, too, which kind of underscores our selection. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you can go to that painting in the gallery. It'll bring you, you know, so there's like a way of navigating it. It's, again, it's like a, it's a sort of difficult thing to do to have to navigate through all this stuff and still make it feel like you're not going to throw up. And, you know, you know you're not going to, which is hard to do and you're not going to get lost. So I'm thinking of ways to do this. And I feel like we achieved, like, the best way to make this usable with a database. But... Um, oh yeah, and then other tech. If anyone's, I don't know how tech techy you guys are, gals and guys are, but this uses is built built on PHP, MySQL. That's like the back end on the server. So you know, it's a really open source database technology. Costs nothing aside from the knowledge of how to use it. So it's all doable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is really fascinating. One of the reasons is, and I see several of the students here who mm. have um, done this, is that we. Um, I don't know if teach is the right word, but we have a course here where our students use Google SketchUp to yep. create exhibitions. Yep. And I just wonder, this this software is obviously, I think, much more challenging. You know, there's a lot more that you yeah. have to know yeah. to do it. But, um, you know, could you compare that? Well, I've, I've, I've never, done? full disclosure, never used SketchUp, but I do, I'm familiar with it. It's a very basic 3D modeling program, basically. Okay. So it has the same... Not to say, I don't want to say the same DNA, but it has the same heuristics and basic. Well, you describe this as sort of a CAD. Yeah, Cinema 4D is kind of like everything, right? Yeah. So it's like for animation, so you can do modeling, yeah. and then you can rig things and animate them. For gaming, it's perfect, right? You can also do like architectural, and they do many architectural work. A lot of architectural work is done in it. Because it's not just a, SketchUp, I'm, if I remember, is not so handy when it comes to like working with materials, textures, lighting, 
that's where Cinema 4D departs. You have to build a lot of stuff separately and then yeah. insert it. Like right. these build stuff on Photoshop. And, and flat, like basically flattened artwork. Yeah. yeah. So and, then, and these are all things that if we can have a better system. Yeah. <laughs> Cinema 4D is the, it's the bomb to put it bluntly. It's, uh, I mean, it is the coin of the realm in terms of 3D modeling. There are many other like blenders is it, and open source Is it open source? Is, no, so, no. Okay. Cinema 4D costs a good amount of money. It's, it's, it's not just the licensing. It's also the technology required to use it reliably. Like you need to have, you need to have like, hopefully if you're in a production pipeline, several video cards, okay. you know, and like it's, it's, okay. and then that means you're using windows, which I, I'm, I abhor. So like there's that aspect of it, but um, you know, cause then you get the, you know, you get, you can really upgrade your machine to where it needs to be. You need like a $10,000 machine to really work in a, Okay, so I'll, SketchUp's yeah. cool. Yeah. For, uh, let me, uh, let me yeah. ask you a question. Are, are there collaborations in your program? You know, with people mm -hmm. like David and people like me that collaborate? Um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, definitely when we have a design um, for um, an exhibition, like maybe Anne, you should speak to this. I mean, we, we work with developers and things yeah. like that. Oh, is that we do some mean? things in-house. We outsource some yeah. things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But okay. usually there's, I mean, with our projects, there's often a faculty member slash curator working with Jesse and sometimes students and then the tech people that we work with outside. Yeah. One thing I would say is just a rejoinder is that SketchUp, I mean, okay, Cinema 40 was probably overkill for this. Because, I mean, we were doing, the Carlo, the modeler, was doing things that we couldn't replicate. That's the guy in Montenegro? Yeah. No, no, no. That's the guy who was making the model. He was working in Cinema 4D, just building this thing and, and working with textures and lighting and stuff. And, and it's like he had all these ideas. Like every frame, for example, he had gotten 3D models for every frame. And, and they're beautiful. They're generic, like, they're generic frames, though. He did not. Yeah, yeah. We just got, They weren't modeled from, you know, but he would get like, you know, these really great frames, which if you were like looking at this sideways at an angle, they would be three dimensional and you could see every detail. And, every and in this a game, amazing. like with a, with a very high performance system, a console, they would, that would all render. And like the beautiful skylight would come through and it would light up these frames as close as pop, much more realistic and much more close to the original That's experience. Right. But you need like a high tech machine to do that. I mean, just to, just so you know, like Apple or, um, Microsoft, who makes the Xbox, they generally lose money on the Xboxes because they they have to put a lot of money into them. They're selling games I'm not and licensing games, you know. I mean, well, I guess the issue here though is um, for us, if this is so for a student who's doing an exhibition, the point is to think about spatial yeah. organization and yeah. ex the experience of moving yeah. through space and all those things, and you don't really need the kind of very high level perfection right. of that kind of 3D modeling to yeah. do that. But what I would I mean, say is, it is cool though to think about, um, I mean, again, I can't really speak to like the limitations of SketchUp so much, but I know that with lighting. <laughs> There's some know, people in this room who could. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's like, I mean, it's a, you know, I, I know it's like limited in what it can do, but it's good for what it is, which is a, you know, a web 2.0 tool for adding 3D content online. You can't do that with something like Cinema 4D. Uh, it's it has a learning curve. It's more for people that are going to be into production and gaming and stuff. But there, Blender is another open. That's an open source three D modeling tool, which is very close to the level of Cinema four D. Um, and it again requires a learning curve. But it's I mean you can use that for really sort of um, true to life renderings of things. You know. Okay. Yep. This is great, by the way. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious about um, accessibility mm -hmm. when you guys were designing, like, can people navigate without a mouse and, like, and no. things like that? <laughs> Not really. I mean, that's where the next sort of phase would come in because we were talking, we've been talking, I think Sally is resistant, but we were talking about <laughs> uh, VR, uh, a sort of VR off spin of this. I mean, it's dying to be VR. I mean, it's really, and Play Canvas, another thing I should mention about Play Canvas which is the framework upon which all this is sort of running in the browser is like built to then be, be ported to VR very easily. You know, and this is sort of where I think it's headed because this is much more accessible, a VR component, I should yeah. say, where, you know, you've, as, as long as you can see, right, and you can, you can operate a simple sort of tool for, for pointing and 
actuating and stuff, you can use this. Whereas on a on a on a machine like a, a terminal, it's a little bit harder. Okay. You know, you have to be able to have fingers that can, you know, a little bit more dexterous and. Um, and David and, prepared a proposal that we've sent to the New York Public Library because <clears throat> yeah. they own all this stuff or did yeah. before you time. And um, they are, would we say resistant? Well, there's not resistant. It's just, you know, from, and I sent it to two relatively, like, hip people working there. And there's, their, word, their, their comment back was, this is amazing. It's going to have to go, like, up the chain. And I work at a bureaucracy. I work at Lehman. So and it's, sorry, to like it's to do what with it? To make a VR for them a, or oh, at AR. the library. Basically, they one thing they have going for them is tourists. Tourists, you know, they have like a whole library tourism. They corner the market, right? So that they, you know, they have people just coming in to see the place, not take out books, right? So I'm thinking, well, that would be perfect to put like a couple of VR stations in the lobby when you walk in, and you can put on these goggles and you can re-enter this the space on the, you know, on the grounds of the, the NYPL. It's a great way to learn about the history. I mean, they have, up right now what they have is just a couple, they have a hallway where they have these little printouts about the history of everything we've been talking about, the Lennox and the Tillman Trust and all that stuff. Right. And they're just like little placards. But David, they great, said they but, can't you know. put it in the front hall because <clears throat> the tourists. In other words, you've got people walking around with goggles and you've got yeah, but 10,000 tourists going by. Disney so. can do it, so, you yeah, know, they can't do it. You know, that's the way I look at it is... Yeah. It can be made into something. It's accessible for foot traffic. Okay. The question is: is is the, is the system in place going to bite on something like that? I mean, they have who knows? Like, the, I I don't work in a administrative bureaucracy, as so I can't really comment on it. But I do know that there's a lot of voices right in this kind of thing. And there are people whose voice is saying, "We like we have a good thing going right now. Let's keep it the way it is." Uh, there are people that are saying, "Let's we got to revamp. We got to do something new and, and exciting." And then there's people in the middle that just don't care, you know. Yeah. Well, it sort of goes back to the question of um, is this the scholarly apparatus right. okay. about this? Okay. Because um, I think it's in the same it's in the same kind of conversation as the rendering of the frames. Yeah. Right. It's technically possible. Yeah. But is it necessary is it? Yeah. for the delivery of the kind of art historical yeah. content which is driving the project as a as a humanities project as opposed, right. to, as opposed to an experience? If it's about the frames, it might be. Well, it, yeah. no, sure. Yeah. It depends. It depends what you want. Yeah. People to know about. Right. This room. Yeah, I feel like sure. The, but I'm thinking about the visitors to NYPL, and I'm yeah. thinking they're probably they don't care not the, yeah. gonna yeah. want this as a scholarly yeah. no, information no, delivery true. apparatus. It would be an experience. And so, yeah, is it? Yeah, is is it, it. Is yeah, it? It's ex yeah. No, it's it, and and I think also ironically that perhaps the library isn't the best place to explore its qual its its scholarly. Stuff because it, the libraries aren't organized that way. Mm -hmm. Do I have another? I have yeah. another question. How how much? Because you said that you published an article on this. Yeah, on this the too. article is is within that website. It's within the site. Yeah. So yeah. how much? How much scholarly apparatus exists around this experience so, in the site itself in terms of histor essays, history, you I'll know, show other you. kinds of like how much reading can you do so, around yeah. the exploring? That was the model zoomed in. Uh, yeah. I just unzoomed on full framed it. Yeah. So this is the article. Okay. It's maybe, in real world terms, maybe five, six pages. No, it's maybe more. Uh, no, no, it's the, we're talking uh, 20. All right. Wow. It's like okay. a journal article. Yeah, exactly. Thing. Exactly. And, and okay. in, Same thing. But in the article, there are examples of, like, what are, like, hyperlinks, basically. Right. That pull they, you in, that pull you in. They actually refer to the model. Yep. So okay. as you're reading, and I can go back to where I was reading, gotcha. you can actually, it's okay. it's more like a living illustration. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, an yeah. interactive yeah. illustration. Nice. In, in this context, anyway. Yeah. 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 Are the 19th century photographs available for overlay? And what additional layers of information do their compositions tell us about? So we talked about that actually, that specific question. Um, I don't know how I don't know if you followed it, but because you no, were no, no, no. you had other things we were to, but <laughs> you know they're available. You they're available here, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, so they're, they're, they're part of the the evidence, like the you right, know the exactly. the primary sources, right? So I, I originally was thinking I was talking to the oops, I'm sorry. I was talking to the, the publishers and I was saying, wouldn't it be cool if there were multiple layers of information on this? And, and at the click of a button, you could toggle on and off oh, wow. the original yeah. photographs, you know, <laughs> mapped to mm -hmm. the, the model. And there were, and there, you know, there, it was like an anodyne response, but basically they, they wanted other things, you know, 
before that was even discussed. But so that's basically that never came to pass, right? Yeah, but I think it's a sweet spot that the, yeah. uh, the editors are looking at is you know how much of this is an experience and how much of it is a, is a, is a scholarly mm -hmm. research tool, and perhaps they yeah they didn't yeah. They, and and I, I also have to sing their praises, even though I was ready to kill them most of the time. Um, they've been in this digital humanities business a while, and they really know what they're doing, and they've got long essays um, about the projects. And what you haven't shown them is where it says project narrative. Yeah. This will be very important for all of you. Yeah, you Because should this. I give the background historical mm -hmm. take on it, and then David lays out all the, mm -hmm. the digital part that he was lecturing yeah. on. So... We've captured that for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can just, yeah. So, so no need to take notes. But I think, I mean, I think it kind of goes to 19th century art worldwide <laughs> that they want these projects to be totally transparent. Mm. And that's their mm -hmm. commitment to the scholarly community um, in terms of making these extremely utilitarian. Um, it's just, you know, it's a, I, I would love some thoughts on this because I think what David and I have done is pioneering. That I have not seen this kind of fulsome commi commitment to the digital humanities as, as this project. Um, I mean, even, even the other projects that they've published uh, are not as focused and as rich as this particular one. And I'm not trying to, yes, I am trying to do that. Because I think one thing David and I have talked about is, the, is that we, we created a remarkable collaboration um, that was, I don't, did we have one fight? No, but no. we don't, I mean. We don't do that. <laughs> Um, so, but it, so that was a very exciting experience. Um, I, I've never worked so hard in my life. That's the other. Um, he has a question. As well. Oh yes, yeah, I'm sorry. So, I mean, I, <clears throat> I mean, to general admiration, presume um, this question of ex, of sort of the experience versus the scholarship though, does raise a question, and that is really in terms of. You, you talked about wanting to create a kind of template for yes. others. Yeah. So I want to know how much this whole thing cost mm -hmm. and how long it took. Because mm -hmm. to make it scalable, exportable, mm -hmm. it has to be at a price that's accessible. Yeah. And I think, you know, lest this be if you have a hammer, everything is a nail, right? right? Yeah. It's gotta right. it's gotta serve different users. Um, for different purposes, yeah. right? So this is nice if you have a perfectly square room right. and you have paintings. Yeah. What if you have an irregularly sized room with three-dimensional objects, some of which are in the middle of the space? Yeah, we had actually, we were talking about this on the phone, yeah. and um, at the time when we had talked about it, they had just found some new, uh, they pulled this out of the muck, uh, some, some dinosaur bone. And they, had, they were able to do, now they can do like this x-ray, sort of very in-depth, in uh, X-rays on fossils of different, you know, different, using different wavelength, wavelengths and things to find details that you couldn't have found in the 1800s when these things were first found. And um, it, it occurred to me, like, did, wouldn't this be great as opposed to something like a room if you could have a model, like a because they can also digitize these models now really easily with you know 3D scanners and things to have like an annotated model of a say of, of a bone and you could you know look through the different details and they would all sort of be little annotations. And you could pop out and click them. That's totally possible. Getting, but the, your question is, well, how much is it going to cost? And it costs, you know, that's but a question for Sally. Between thirty and forty thousand dollars. Between thirty and forty thousand. And he did not take a salary, nor did I. Yeah. Okay, so the development. Yeah, the development is really somebody has. But to, also is, hiring the research people. Yeah, I, yeah. I paid them oh, for sure. Yes. Um, and that's on top of the research, on top of the 30, 40? No, that's inclusive. Including the 30, 40. I think we, the developer was like around 8,000. Yeah, it right? may have been. You mean Leonardo? Yeah. yeah. I think so it may have been so than then the question is, if we were to compare this to the cost of a finely produced catalog, okay. book catalog, yeah. could easily come to 100, 75, 100. Yeah. So how, how do you think issue. about the volume? If this were a book, mm -hmm. right, how would you calculate guesstimate, yeah. pages, and word count. Because now I'm trying to compare the apples and the oranges. Yeah, no, and I, you know, it's, because I come from books, and it's like... <laughs> well, there's a page for every work. Right. And then so there's a page, there's pages to just, for the comparisons of different works. Right. The, the, and they would have to be sort of static comparisons. You couldn't come up with them on the fly like a user could. Right. So you're, you're losing a little bit of a right. connection there, but you could do it. 
and then there's the all the scholarly article, the right. all that, the detail, uh, the ar archival photos. These are all plates, you know, in the book, all full color and most. Yeah, pieces. but I think you immediately run yeah, into the limitations because yeah. yeah. we can do an infinite number of comparisons. Right, but yeah. bearing that in mind, I'm just trying to think. So, what are you thinking? Two fifty, three hundred yeah. pages. I think so. Yeah, I mean, what do you think? You said one hundred and forty-seven. One hundred forty-seven paintings, but that's, but that's just just the paintings. Just yeah. the right. paintings, and not the comparison. And then there's footnotes and bibliography. Yeah, yeah. yeah. appendices. Yeah. Yes. Um, so two hundred fifty, two hundred fifty, three hundred pages. Yeah. So at that scale, it's not it's it's that's not a big price it's difference at all. No. Yeah. No. Okay. I don't think so. Um, yeah. No. And it, if David, I mean, I goodness knows Sorry. how much you should have really been paid. I mean, and scholars work for nothing. I need tenure. I don't need yeah. money. Yeah. <laughs> 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 as long as once you get tenure, then you want the money. Yeah, then I want the money. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been nice to have someone. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, that, this is no question digital humanities is, for the most part, cheaper. It's because of its scalability, generally, is why it's cheaper, but also its reach. You reach more people. Right. You can get more content. The content's not linear, and it's, um, it's emergent. Like, you know, the I content is... I don't think it's cheaper. Like, we can do a, mo a monograph of 250 pages for 5,000 bucks. Well, yeah. So we have to just remember it. I mean, in terms of the, the how rich the content is, it's hard. I mean, it's a hard thing to quantify. Yeah. But, I mean, you, you there are certain things also that you can't do with a book. Right. You know? They're just... It, I mean, there's certain things you can't do... With this. With this. Right. Like, if, right. the, if the power wasn't... Or if the projector wasn't <laughs> yeah. working, this wouldn't be happening, right? Or if my battery fails, we're not having this discussion, right? So, in a book, that's not a problem. But a book, you also can't share with a room full of people at the same time. So, you know, in the yeah. same way, anyway. It's much harder. and uh, You certainly can't share it with a whole, you know, world full of people. Uh, you know, so... They're, they're totally different things. And it's... They're not, they're apples and oranges in some way, um, even though the content is the same. But I feel like the emergent properties of a digital humanities project outweigh, you know, the, the, the benefits of a book or whatever they happen to be. Well, it, 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 I also think, I, speaking of the money, it should never be done on the, done on the cheap, because you're going to get crap. Um, it just be not worth it. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's a real challenge for institutions to make, to make that kind of open-ended because we had no idea how much it was going to cost us going in. Did you? Did you have any idea? Um, no, I had a guess, but I was wrong. And so. <laughs> <laughs> it would be more. I thought it would be more, to uh, be honest Oh, with you. it would be more? Yeah, totally, yeah. Because, you know, Carlo, he did the modeling. I think he was like $1,500. Yeah. That's, okay. not, that's not much money. Yeah. That was a friendship deal. <laughs> you know, modelers, they work. They're like editors or, you know, video <laughs> editors. They're like freelancers. They work $500 a day, you know, and if it takes them 20 days, there you go. It's thousands of dollars. You're, you're not going to see again. So, I mean, that, just that right there. And developers, like, he, I feel like he was actually pretty good for a developer, but again, he doesn't have to live in New York City where these really hot developers are. Like, they're not living in, in a brownstone in Brooklyn. They're, this guy's in Montenegro, you know, where, you know, he, the penny is on the dollar for his living expenses. So he can charge $8,000 for all this work. And he had a passion for the project. Like, it just kind of worked out. So like in real terms, if I if you ask me, say I want to do this, right. I, I want to recreate the the first um, you know impressionist exhibition, right. right? And I had to go out in the city, right, or in this area, and find people to model it, and then develop for this platform, and then maybe you're paying me, I don't know, but say you even are, we're talking thousands. And you didn't thousands you didn't have to buy rights for any of the images. No, no. Oh, uh, there were a few, but not too many. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's if you really had to changed. buy rights for images for global use. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of museums don't charge. Yeah, that depends, depends where it is. It depends, depends where it is. Minimal, yeah. Minimal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it can be expensive. I mean, our, our, ours, New York, the arts rights societies, it's expensive. You know, I've I've worked on a book that was a book before, and I was getting like some of the work was donated from like the Berkeley Art Museum. And some of the work had to be cleared through ours, New York, right. and it's just like. Yeah, hundreds of dollars, hundreds of dollars. Temporary project is going to cost more. Mm -hmm. yeah. 19th century, it's pretty easy. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah. No, I have a question about the maintenance of this site. Yeah. <clears throat> do you are you guys like committed to it forever, or do you anticipate like putting it up and taking it down? Oh no, it'll be there as long as we can keep it up. Because it, don't forget, it's part of a larger publication yeah. commitment, and they are they are. I can't tell you how far out ahead of most other within my field they are in terms of archival. Uh, and keeping things going, so we we had to address all those. And David, you you have it on your server, don't you? Yeah, I have a version on my server. Um, 
But like, are you committed to like updating it and maintaining the technology mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Well, I mean, there's a level. There's different levels of commitment. If it's content changes, I've been very, I've been open and saying, yeah, I can handle that. You know, I don't. You know, it's part. Of, it's on my CV. It's like I have to. I have to have it running and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, if I'm ever going to point people to it. But in terms of like, um, you know, sea change types of you know changes, like say, you know, and this is going to happen. Like in six months, it'll happen. There'll be some new technology that'll make this all run smoother. Am I going to like sit down and make it work? Probably not, because okay. I just I don't yeah, have the that's, time. That's good, that's good. Unless someone pays yeah. me to do it. Or, so that's where the book comes in handy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, okay. that's okay. the one of the benefits is tech. This technology. I mean, just. I mean, I'm just dealing with this with like old hard drives not working and old file types not working. They're like 10 years old. I can't even open them anymore. That's a whole other digital humanities question, right? The integrity of the, the, the actual data itself. Well, like um, the, the Barnum thinking. site still works, right? Right. You can right. still yeah. use yeah, it. And, and you can say, well, this is now we can do this better, but you could still go into that and nobody's yeah. redone it. No. no. So it still holds. Although it could use I mean, it. I would still sign <laughs> that in a class. Yeah. You know, you could say, fresh, okay, yeah. early history, collecting in America. Yes. Yeah. These are like. Yeah. Your set, whatever. There's different things you could. Uh, it's usable. Yeah, I think at some point though, this is a really good question. This is a whole other lecture, but uh, I feel that at some point those things, those those, those pieces, are going to be seen as more of relics of like maybe you know early 20th century or 21st century net art or something, and they're going to be themselves the thing that we're talking about. You know, like and, and we kind of are now. We're referencing it reflexively now. Is that this is what we're you know this is where we came from. People. This is what people were thinking in 2003 about how to recreate these spaces. And here we are today. This is what's possible now. And then in 20 years, the whole conversation will be different. So it's interesting how the response to the piece becomes itself like its own sort of artifact. I find that really fascinating. I think it's already sort of at that point. But. I just want to remind every... Oh, sorry. Was there any thought to the web design beyond the... Yeah, this is their website. Yeah, yeah it's very accurate. <laughs> Yeah, as a web designer, I I think this is actually th this. I mean, I designed, of course, the this thing, right? But everything else you see outside of this box is them. And I think it's like a Cold Fusion site. I don't know how much of a developer anyone in this room is, but Cold Fusion is like the older. It's like a, a, a content management system from the '90s, you know, and it's very antiquated. It was like um, I think Adobe bought it at one point, but. Uh, it's really antiquated. Their site design's antiquated. I'll sh can I just quickly show you my site? I just want to say something while yeah. you're doing that. When you get to the site, 19th Century Art Worldwide, it's and it's still up because it's it's published twice a year. Um, that project narrative has all everything we've talked about, including the money, how much it costs, the names, what the, all the uh, technical stuff, um, and then of course in the scholarly essay you have my brilliance. So if I had my yeah, other, like if this is what I had originally had in mind when I thought that they were going to refer to my site. I was thinking, okay, well, let's build like a really nice site, and you know, and and so this is running on my server. Their server is a little bit faster, though. I would I would mention because it's like an enterprise grade. I'm just like using this. Old so all the same content here. All the same just content, yeah. Parody. Distributed differently, yep. nicer. Like I think so. Interface. I mean, I'm just like yeah. just type of typographically. I, yeah. I, you know, yeah, I'm just thinking. I mean, so I'm a designer, so everything is typed to me. Like yeah. everything has to be textually beautiful, or else it's not readable. You know, and or, you know, it's legible but not readable. There's a difference, right? So for me, this is huh? or enticing. Yeah. Yeah. Experience. Part of the experience. It's, of course. Yeah. So I was very key. This is what I wanted. Very close to what I wanted. And then they're thinking. They were saying, or later on in the stage of the project, they're saying, no, no, it's going to be hosted on our site. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Then I look at their site and their, you know, their 90s banner, and I'm thinking, uh, I can't say anything about it. It's not my role. But, um, but that's why we, why I also wanted to maintain it here as well. Well, I think we are out of time. But we, yeah. and thank you, you guys, everybody. if you're willing thank to you. stay around and anybody has any further yeah, follow-up questions. But yeah, yeah, please join me in thank you. Thank you. Thank you.